Acts chapter 18, verse 9, please. Acts chapter 18 and verse 9. All right, let's cover some apologetics here. And yes, I'm going to kick these people again. All right, so Calvinism, they teach that uh, the Lord takes away your free choice and that you don't have a free choice to get saved. That's what they teach. This is all around Dutch Reformed. This is around Presbyterian churches. This, is, this doctrine has been a root hold among the intellectual crowd of Christianity. So this is a dangerous doctrine. So Calvinism versus free choice. Let's look at the Calvinist side right here. Their proof text is Acts chapter 18. That's their first proof text right here. Let's see if this proves election where there is no free choice involved, but God had to do all the work. Acts chapter 18. We will read verse ten, uh, 9. The Bible says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vi uh, vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Look at this last part. For I have much people in this city. Ah, so it seems like right here that Acts chapter 18, verse 9 through 10, that God already set up, ordained, decreed for Paul that there's a, a great amount of people in the city who will get saved. See, so their free choice was not involved right here. They were forced to salvation because God already set and planned it all out. So that's the Calvinist proof text. This is a famous Calvinist proof text that you want to remember. It's one of their popular usages. Now, the simple debunking to this is that if you look at verse 11, the context proves that it is not the elect, or that God elected before the foundation of the world, who are about to get saved, but rather people who were already saved who needed to be taught the word of God. Yeah. Okay, so look at verse 11. For I have, okay, the last part of verse 10 says, for I have much people in this city, right? But look at this. This is talking about, verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. See that? So these were already saved people. So because there were already a lot of people who got saved at verse 10, God was saying to Paul, see, I got all these people who just got saved. I have much people, so keep preaching and teaching. That's why at verse 11, he kept preaching and teaching to those people. Why? Because there were already a lot of saved people over there. Not that there were so many people who were lost and God says, okay, you're going to get these many people saved ahead of time. No, that's not the idea here. In fact, you'll notice that there are already a lot of people who did get saved. Let's look at verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. So notice right here, we got two converts by name here. Look at verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice. Here's another one. One that worshipped God, whose house joined heart to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, there's another one, believed on the Lord with all his house. See, they were already saved that time. Not like God had to ordain and plan later on after that. Keep reading. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. See, there were so many who got saved. That's why verse 9 and 10, God says, see, I already have much people saved here in this city, Paul. So you just go ahead, keep teaching and preaching. <laughs> it's that simple. The idea, see, they pick and choose. Calvinists, they always like to pick and choose verses. They don't read the context. Exegesis, eisegesis, blah, 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 blah. They always keep resorting to that. Well, they didn't look at proper exegesis right here. And some of them, some of them would just call it eisegesis quite often. But I think it's more accurately called exegesis if I'm going to argue from my point here. But anyway, aside from that, we're not just going to, we're not going to debate semantics here. We're just going to look at some verses here. Scripture with Scripture disproves arguments. Let's get down to the core of the arguments right here. Okay, so let's also look at another one. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. 
Another favorite Calvinist proof text that it seemed like God gave eternal life to those who were already given by the Father. Uh, so in other words, God already found a certain group of people who he chose to get saved. So then he handed those people over to his son. See, so it shows that there is no free choice of yours involved. It's more like God had to do all the work and give Jesus the handout. That's what they're going to argue. So look at John chapter 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Ooh, see, there's your problem. So God can only give eternal life to those that God chooses to give to Jesus. So there, your free choice is not involved. You can't just go to God's hand and get saved. No, God has to pick and choose. So that's Calvinism. Calvinism, I mean, I may be joking right here, but it is literally this. It is literally God taking up a piece of flour and then going like, okay, so this guy's in, this guy's out, this guy's in, this guy's out, this guy's out, okay, this guy's in, okay, this guy's out, 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 okay, like this. Okay, and then I'll choose this guy for my elect. So here are those that are lost, and then here are those that are the elect. This is Calvinist teaching. Now I'm giving a, I know I'm giving a humorous example, but this is what they teach. All that God gave in my hand, so nope, that's not going to be part of my hand, but this will be part of my hand, this was going to be part of my hand. That is Calvinism. You see a joke to this? This is a joke. Okay, so we're going to see verse 6. They don't understand this. They fail to see that these people given by the Father to the Son are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's who they are, okay? Because look at verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto who? The men which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Look at that. They already kept his word. These are referring to his disciples that he was dealing with right then and there. Verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, see, his disciples, where Jesus was uh, walking around in the world, is referring to his disciples. That's true, Jesus Christ was the one who chose the disciples. No brainer. All right, let's keep reading. I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition. See, Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, so there's no doubt from the context right there, this is definitely referring to disciples right here, the disciples of the Lord. Now, another thing to understand is this, is that do you know why they were given by the Father to the Son? They were given by the Father to the Son because they received and believed on Him to begin with. So when you do that, you can become a disciple of the Lord. And then it is up to God's own choosing who He wants to use for a certain part of work. There's your idea. So let's look at verse 7 through 9. Verse 7 through 9. The Bible says, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have what? Believe that thou didst sent me. Ah, that's why. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. See, why did they become... Uh, God's hand that he gave to the Lord Jesus Christ as his disciples because they received and believed it. They received and believed it. So you got to understand, anyone can be given by the Father to the Son if they believed on Christ for salvation. This is anybody right here because if you don't believe me, look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall what? Believe 
on me to their word. Oh, so it's not just these disciples, it's anyone who chooses to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. So here's the idea. This is the problem with Calvinists. They keep ignoring this. They keep ignoring this. This doctrine is called unconditional election. Unconditional election. That's their doctrine. But if you look at the book of John chapter 17, it debunks from their passage 1 to 2 and 6, it debunks it when you look at verse 6, 11 through 12, and then you look at it again from verses 7 through 9, and then you look at it again from verse 20. It completely debunks that notion. Calvinists think, okay, unconditionally, you had no free choice. God had to pick and choose who, would he, who he would elect. That's unconditional election. But we argue here from this passage, no, those that God gave to the Son are those who what? Believe on Him. It's a conditional election. Why did God give these to the Son? Simple, because they followed the condition. Duh. Okay, it's that simple. It's not like God said, okay, unconditionally, nope, nope, oh, I believe in you, Jesus. Nope, nope, sorry, sorry, nope. No, you have to follow the condition, and then God chooses you, and then he'll hand them over to the Son. Like to make it picture like you had no condition, no free will. You're going to be surprised how many of the Calvinist proof texts you're going to find a condition uh, involved within their verses. That's what you're going to be surprised to see. So what you're going to notice right here is that concerning these verses right here, that unconditional election is a baloney doctrine. And it is literally, Calvinism is a doctrine uh, where you picture this cartoon show of a guy who takes out a flower and says, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. Save, lost, save, lost. Dr. Upman, in his book, little booklet, on Calvinism, he has a picture of so-called God holding a flower, taking out certain pe uh, petals of the flower and keeping certain petals, and in each petal it says, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. That is the doctrine of Calvinism. 